So our next speaker is Bill, oh, thanks, Bill. Bill Lowe, and Bill's going to talk about identification of regulatory variation important for maternal metabolism during pregnancy. Okay, thank you, Eric. So I'm going to be coming from a different perspective uh, as a person with clinical training who's interested in a specific phenotype, in this case, maternal metabolism during pregnancy. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, how we've used ENCO data to try and, whoops, this is pretty sensitive. Um, how we've used ENCO data to try and move that forward. I'd also like to say, although I'm the person giving the talk right now, that this re represents a collaboration between myself and Tim Reddy, who's at Duke and a member of the ENCO consortium. And just a plug for NHGRI, uh, Tim's and my collaboration began about three and a half years ago when uh, NHGRI uh, arranged a, what I could best be called a speed dating event uh, between Geneva and uh, ENCODE. And uh, it was sort of a propitious time for both of us, and so it's worked out quite well. So I think as we've heard, you know, just looking at type 2 diabetes and uh, a variety of related glycemic traits, as someone who's interested in the genetics of the, of the disease, you know, what we see is that there's a whole number, as we've developed larger and larger cohorts, there's a large number of genes that have been shown to be associated with the disease or the phenotypes. But I think it's fair to say in most cases we don't, A, don't know, un understand the functional variation that's responsible for this, and in many cases don't yet understand uh, how the specific gene products contributes to the phenotype. So the phenotype that we've been uh, studying is maternal metabolism during pregnancy. Um, there are a number of changes in metabolism that occur during pregnancy to accommodate the growing fetus. Uh, the, most, some of these are shown here. First, there's a decrease in fasting glucose, which occurs despite an increase in insulin resistance. And that increase in insulin resistance, not surprisingly, is accompanied by increased fasting insulin levels, increased insulin secretion, as well as increased hepatic glucose production. So we've uh, did a GWAS using uh, 4,500 mothers uh, from uh, four different ancestry groups, a population-based study looking at a variety of metabolic traits and found uh, a number of genes that uh, demonstrated genome-wide significant association with either fasting glucose, fasting C-peptide, or two-hour glucose levels. Uh, several of these were uh, genes that were known to be associated with uh, glucose-related traits in non-gravid populations, but two of them were ones that had not previously been shown in non-gravid populations. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our studies with HKDC1 initially. So we were able to, uh, so, you know, here's HKDC1, which is located uh, on chromosome 10. I should mention this is called hexokinase, hexokinase domain containing 1. It sits right next to hexokinase 1. And uh, if you overlay it over the ENCODE data, we are happy to see that, in fact, it looks like an area that's relatively transcriptionally active. There's a lot of open chromatin in this region, as well as some uh, enhancer marks. And then here is, this was our lead SNP, but a number of SNPs in this region demonstrated um, association. And in fact, you could demonstrate that it's also, this gene's also expressed, which was in a number of different cell types, and that was consistent with our findings uh, looking at normal human tissues that the gene was uh, widely um, express. <clears throat> so the next question was, uh, which of these gene, which of these variants account for the uh, w account for the association that we're seeing, and what's the mechanism of the association? So uh, a, a graduate student in, in Tim's lab, Carl Guo, uh, took it upon himself to uh, look at, uh, as you'll see in the next slide, divide this uh, this gene up into about 11 different regions based on the DNA1 hypersensitivity sites that have been identified. Uh, are characterized by ENCODE, and then synthesized DNA fragments that contained all the different haplotypes uh, rep represented in each of those regions based upon 1,000 genomes data. Uh, you could then put those into luciferase reporter vectors, transfect those into cells to see which impacted gene expression. So you can see here the 11 regions that were identified over the uh, 11 sort of uh, areas that he tested over the uh, HKDC1 locus. And in fact, what, we, what, what Carl showed was that there are, if you see here, uh, four, in this case, four different SNPs uh, from four of these different regions uh, that demonstrated a change in, uh, in which it impacted luciferase expression, presumably through an impact on gene expression. Uh, each of these were also, uh, each of these variants were in a region where there was a SNP that demonstrated uh, genome-wide significant association, and probably more importantly, uh, these SNPs also aligned with, uh, H with EQ previously demonstrated EQTLs uh, for HKDC1 in uh, liver. Importantly, also, uh, in, you can see down here in bold, each of the bold SNPs, in fact, uh, 
each of the bold SNPs, which was associated with decreased gene expression, was also associated with two high, two, higher two-hour glucose levels uh, in the mothers. So this led to the hypothesis um, that lower HKDC1 expression may, in fact, be associated with higher glu two-hour glucose levels. And in fact, we're, you know, we have some data in mouse to suggest that might be true. But, you know, I think you can appreciate that this is a relatively tedious and laborious approach to sort of marching your way through um, these regions. And um, also, as uh, suggested by Eric, as you start to sequence these regions in greater numbers of people, you're going to find increasing number of variants. So the question was, was there a, a faster way to move from causal variants uh, to function in a, th in a high throughput manner? And, you know, could you develop new functional assays of gene expression that could be, and specifically, could you use donor DNA to, for uh, functional assays of gene expression? This would have the advantage of both, of a, sort of directly testing personal rare variants that are going to be identified uh, through sequencing as, sequencing as well as for haplotypes to be uh, tested directly. So to address that, Tim uh, developed an approach uh, based on the STAR-seq approach, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. So the idea is rather than as I'll show in the next slide, rather than uh, testing a variety of uh, fragments of DNA for enhancer activity per se, um, one could take the DNA capture libraries uh, that were used for sequencing, take those fragments and put them down, put them into the StarSeq vector, uh, and then, you know, downstream of, in this case, GFP, uh, transfect those into cells and then uh, by doing RNA-seq to look at differences between the input and output libraries to see if there are variants that impact uh, expression. So we, we've, got, we've recently gotten the sequence data from our locus on chromosome 10, but we've not been able to test that. But this, it has been tested on a, a related trait, fetal adiposity, which uh, is another trait that's related to maternal glucose metabolism. And there's locus on chromosome 3 that we've been studying. So again, now using the ENCODE data, uh, we, uh, Tim had sequenced across this region, uh, choosing a variety of targets based upon uh, areas of open chromatin to uh, look for variants. So then he could take these fragments, which are about 450 to 500 base pairs in length, clone them into the star-seq vector and transfect them into cells. So, um, so you can transiently transfect these into a relevant cell type, and then you can do high-throughput uh, sequencing of expressed reporter gene to measure the allele-specific regulatory activity of each amplicon. Uh, and what you can see here is there was, a there was fairly good correlation between the allele frequency, the targeted sequencing allele frequency versus the frequency in the input library. And you'd anticipate that there would be some outliers that were fragments that contained, uh, uh, fragments that contained variants that affect, affect gene expression. So um, across this region, th these data were done initially with, uh, based upon uh, using uh, fragments from 95 um, individuals. Um, there were 321 SNPs identified among those individuals, 283 of which were successfully assayed. And if you did replicate experiments, the, re the uh, concordance between experiments was uh, quite high. Importantly, about 32 percent of the SNPs of these SNPs were uh, rare, defined as a, a mean allele frequency less than 1 percent. And 29% uh, of the assayed SNPs were also rare, suggesting that you weren't losing uh, rare SNPs along the way. And then 27 common and 9 rare SNPs uh, demonstrated significant fold changes in regulatory activity, varying, I guess, depending on how you look at it, some either decreasing gene expression uh, or others increasing gene expression. So you can see some reasonable changes. So obviously then, you know, you have to validate these uh, changes uh, using a more standard assay. So these fragments were then cloned 5' prime to a luciferase gene. So previously they were 3' prime, now they're 5' prime. Uh, and then looking to see at their impact on uh, expression. And in each case, the allele with a higher level of expression in the initial assay also demonstrated higher level of expression, or in this case, increased luciferase expression um, in this uh, more standard assay. And then if you look at one of these alleles, uh, RS4266144, um, in fact, that overlay, that is part of a TED4 binding site. Uh, and um, you can see that, in fact, uh, there's a G allele and a C allele. The C allele was the allele with the higher level of, uh, of expression. Um, you can see the ancestral allele appears to be 
Um, the uh, G allele is, is reflected by not other non-human primates. Um, in fact, the G allele is more common in humans as well, albeit it's about 50-50. It's a relatively common variant. The, I don't know why this turned into a black box. The Neanderthal variant was also a G uh, allele as well. So, suggest, so this you know, allows us now to sort of hone in on this particular site as one uh, that may be important for the phenotype that we're um, interested in. So just to conclude and get us a little bit of time back, um, so um, in terms of what gap, you know, the gap that's being filled, so I, I think, you know, one of the ideas is that uh, this could be in a sort of a disease agnostic way developing new technologies that allow for more rapid screening of functional variants that can be tested um, is something that would be appropriate. Uh, for uh, NHGRI. Um, obviously, uh, those trying to identify, try to determine the impact of those variants uh, may be then, uh, or using those technologies to identify functional variation may be done more appropriately through, uh, as it relates to specific phenotypes, uh, um, but, you know, the technologies, I think, would be, could be uh, developed in a more, obviously, disease agnostic uh, sort of way. You know, thinking about what other uh, resources might be of value, I think one of the challenges faced as someone uh, who's interested in the phenotypes is many times getting relevant uh, cell types for functional studies is a challenge, uh, and uh, developing resources, uh, whether they're iPS-derived or primary cells or other types of cells, right, so that we're not forever looking at uh, cancer cell lines, specifically in the diabetes world, beta cell lines that really recapitulate function are hard to... Uh, come by. The cell lines are not necessarily uh, that great. Um, what other efforts? Uh, I think we heard a lot about EQTLs, and I think we've heard a lot at this meeting as well about the idea that many of the EQTLs have been identified in basal states, understanding them in sort of a perturbed state. Uh, my, for example, in my case, you know, per perhaps in the presence of insulin resistance would be of, of uh, interest, and uh, I'll conclude uh, with that. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry, I just want to acknowledge uh, Tim uh, and his lab at Duke, who's been a, a, main, a real driver in all of this. Thanks. Questions for Bill? So, so this, um, really thinking about it is fascinating. I mean, this appears to be then very scalable, right? Meaning you essentially go through ENCODE to figure out which regions of the genome to clone, but I presume that uh, you, yeah. you don't even need that, meaning you could use right. it as corroborating evidence. Right. So, in fact, I think the idea would be that you could do the uh, test for the variation, and then as you identify the variation, perhaps go back to ENCODE then to see those that lie in region, you know, variants that, or fragments that contain, you know, uh, potential variants of interest, uh, you could go back to ENCODE though and, and maybe prioritize those that you're going to follow up based upon how they overlay uh, ENCODE data. But I'm wondering about the detection ability, meaning you could screen for, um, I guess you're looking at however many elements that right. you could screen for thousands, right. tens of thousands of millions of such elements. Agreed, agreed, yes, yeah, absolutely. And you could, and, and we, this was done on a small scale with, you know, 95 individuals. Actually, we're doing it on 800 at, this, at the current time. It, it's sort of related. I mean, this is, you can look at so many of them now, people, and there are multiple ways of doing it. There are a variety. A number of people have just saturation mutagenized areas, right. too, even if they're not naturally occurring yet, mm -hmm. to see what can't, you know, what may or may not be. Right. Uh, and as crazy that, as that sounds, uh, I'm not sure that we couldn't do it because you literally can put tens or hundreds of thousands into these types of assays. Right. Uh, I'm not sure that we couldn't do that for, for every base pair or mm -hmm. maybe every conserved region or something like that and, right. and so we know. John. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you mentioned the issue of the cellular context, you know, I think which is a theme in many things. But also, the, there, there are some caveats with these type of assays, right? And, and the caveat is that uh, collectively, the results from those experiments, about 30 percent, 20 to 30 percent, uh, are false positives, which mm -hmm. means they're positive in the enhancer assay, and in the exact same cell type where they're testing something, it's not a DNA hypersensitive site, right? So which is, which is a sine qua non for anything that has ever been found to be an enhancer. So you've got a 30% false positive rate. Uh, 
and you also have about a 60% false negative rate in, in cases where you can look at known enhancers and actually map them back to those assays. And that was part of the driving reason why those kind of assays were abandoned in the late 1980s in favor of other cell-based uh, contexts. So I think that this is, you know, I think that one, you can learn a lot of things, and when they're positive and everything lines up, it's great. But, but I think that, you know, before contemplating a massive assault on the whole picture, I think one has to really understand very carefully what are the properties of the assays in the cells and, and, and everything and kind of map that into the whole, the whole picture. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to echo, I think that the StarSeq and similar protocols are incredibly powerful, but recognizing their limitations is also mm -hmm. really important. And one of the things that I think, you know, to go to John's point is these are sites taken completely out of their context being used on a transiently transfected vector. So you're basically taking chromatin out of the picture, and, and I just don't know to what extent it's safe to do so. Um, because they're it, being put within a transcribed region where the polymerase is cruising through, nucleosomes are not assembling, and so, you know, for everything that ENCODE is invested in understanding how DNA's hypersensitivity and how chromatin modifications can affect enhancers and regulatory regions, I think we don't want to invest too much in an assay that's effectively chromatin-free and out of context. Just to say that um, I, I fully accept what John and uh, Karen just said, but uh, I think one thing that CRISPR opens and thinking about what Will presented late yesterday, there is a way of putting things in their endogenous context. So these assays need to meet each other. There are issues with going after non-coding stuff, but, but that's in, in terms of the, a technology area to invest in, Going after the endogenous context with a lot of synthesized or natural sequence, I think, is a very important direction. There isn't a solution right there available, just, just pull the trigger. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are studies that, that, that John knows that will support that 30% false positive rate. That's not the finding from all the studies, and there are studies where you are, I, I mean, <laughs> our negative controls, we rarely see activity for them in these assays. Now, that being said, I mean, there, there's clearly, there are limitations to this assay, there are limitations to how, how you can interpret any assay, and, and you have to keep those in mind, but um, it, it, you really can get high throughput, and I, I think, I think that the, what you're learning from these uh, transient transfections, in fact, does extrapolate well to, to, as you look in, into more and more uh, 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 assays. So I, I think this is was a, a very exciting prospect. Uh, and you really could, could ramp this up to, to genome-wide uh, uh, efficient coverage. And I, I'm not sure which would be the best population to do it in. But you could do this for P300. You could, I mean, you could really hit this well. Uh, I, I just want to slightly disagree with Karen. I, and, and uh, uh, um, the, yes, we can and we should get where we can do it endogenously, but you do chromatinize the small fra you know, plasmids. We know that you can do it. John, I've, we've done thousands and thousands of these and have never seen a false, ne a false positive. You certainly get false negatives, but we've never seen false positives. And so I think, it's, we're, I think you don't go in saying that this is recapitulating all biology, but it's so fast, so cheap, and even if you just get a hint, just being careful not to overinterpret it, it's extremely valuable. And I mean, this has been going on since transient transfections were invented. You learn an enormous amount from them. You just have to be cautious not to think that it's the entire story. And I think when you get something, it says that base pair can have an effect on transcription. And, and whether it does in real life, um, uh, you know, you may have to do more. So, so I, I, I view it as a, a screen. Right. No, so, I, I, I didn't yeah. want to suggest that this was the end, end answer. Sure, it's sure. really a first step, a very first step. 